Western nations once drove the world economy, but now they're at best sluggish. Last quarter, the U.S. economy grew 2.5 percent, and many European nations remain stuck in prolonged recessions. Global growth is being driven by the BRICS nations. That's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. But will this strength in emerging economies translate into political goodwill? Joining me now to discuss this is Moises Nayane. He's from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a Washington, D.C.-based think tank on international affairs. His latest book is The End of Power, From Boardrooms to Battlefields and Churches to States, Why Being in Charge Isn't What It Used to Be. Also with us today, Eric Farnsworth, Vice President, Council of the Americas. It's a U.S.-based organization that studies political, social, and economic issues confronting Latin America. And it's great to have both of you on the broadcast. Really appreciate it. Um, Left-wing alliances seem to be very strong in Latin America. And I want to ask you, do you think that this is partly because of U.S. intervention in the region in the 70s and 80s? And why don't I start with you? Latin America is divided. It has these left wing left, leftist oriented alliances like for example the alba that includes venezuela cuba um, ecuador and so on but it also has uh, different alliances which are of countries more market oriented there is a very strong alliance being formed the alliance of the pacific that include that includes mexico colombia peru and chile those are the fastest growing countries in latin america and so what we have is a divided continent in which we have different kinds of policies towards foreign investors, towards the United States, geopolitical players that, are, that play with different uh, playbooks. Well, we have a divided Congress here in Washington. Do they have a divided continent down there? Would you agree? I certainly agree with that. But I think the specter of the United States actually looms, continues to loom very large in the Western Hemisphere. And yeah, there is some aspect, some overhang of some of the interventions, as you had mentioned. But you know, I think sometimes that's also an excuse for Latin American leaders, not all of them. Uh, but for those who have chosen perhaps a populist course or a course of some of the countries that Moises mentioned, um, there are real failures in the economy. And oftentimes, it's really easy to actually blame the United States or to blame the, the international system for the failings and therefore not have to take responsibility for the failings that you yourself or your government may be visiting upon your own people. So there's a very interesting aspect there of how history can be used by some leaders to their own benefit. But is it a desire to be free of U.S. influence, do you think? Is that the, the key there? Everyone uh, wants to be more autonomous, be freer from influence, but at the same time they need the United States and some of them have very lucrative arrangements with the United States. One of the most extreme, ironic, paradoxical examples is Venezuela. The Venezuelan leaders before the President Hugo Chavez, now deceased, and now his successor, Nicolas Maduro, denounced the United States every day, and yet they depend on the United States to sell their oil. Without the United States buying their oil, uh, Venezuela's economy that is imploding would be imploding even faster. And so is it a domestic message, but it actually an international desire to go in a different direction than what you're saying domestically? Well, it does seem to be that way. It's certainly the international environment is used for domestic purposes. And we see that, frankly, in countries even that are friends of the United States. Let's look at what hap just happened in terms of Brazil and the United States. You have a president, uh, Dilma Rousseff, who is friends with the United States and a good relationship, but she just canceled a state visit that had been planned months in advance. It was scheduled to be in October. This is unprecedented. It's never happened before from ever any country. And it does go to the point that there are domestic politics in Brazil, there are domestic politics everywhere, and it actually plays differently in Brazil than it might play in the United States. But there seems to be a drip, drip, drip on these Snowden stories. And isn't there a fear that if you come here, then another story appears, and then it's, it's embarrassing? I mean, you can almost understand her reluctance to want to come and to want to cancel, couldn't you? I mean, don't you? Well, sense? I think there's a, certainly an aspect of that. But the fact is, if you allow your international diplomacy to be uh, determined by whether or not there's going to be some bad news in the news cycle, then you'll never do anything. And I think the way the Snowden issue is coming is playing out, that's absolutely right. It is dripping out. They're doing that intentionally. But that could go on ad infinitum, and you really don't know when it's going to end. Dilma Rousseff was very critical of the United States, though, in her comments to the UN General Assembly earlier this week. Let's listen in. Sociedades amigas. Friendly governments and societies that seek to build a true strategic partnership, as in our case, cannot allow recurring illegal actions to take place as if they're normal. They are unacceptable. So Moises, uh, poking the eye for the United States, or was she just playing to her domestic audience? The, the only reason one uh, can see as a very powerful reason to, to 
uh, having canceled the trip uh, is for uh, the fact that uh, President Rousseff's popularity at home is declining. She's dealing with all kinds of uh, political turmoil. Her popularity ratings are falling. She has people in the streets protesting. And there is an element of a sentiment of anti-Americanism in Brazil that she's tapping into. But the fact, you know, that there are books that have been out now for years that are very explicit about how the United States and its intelligence agencies have been spying in Brazil with examples and details, and they know it. They are very public books, and that didn't cause uh, uh, the turmoil that is causing now. So why now and why with such, uh, with such extreme reactions? Well, you have to look, as Eric uh, said, uh, uh, into the domestic politics. But you almost kind of expect uh, uh, one nation to spy on another nation if they're enemies, but they're friends. Well, no. Uh, countries that have spy agencies spy. <laughs> so, you know, you can. They got to stay busy. You, can, you have to say that, you know, one should be surprised at the surprise that the world is now discovering that the United States uh, intelligence agencies are listening. And everybody does it. Uh, China listens in on other countries and even their allies, and Russia and Brazil. And there is no country that, it, in fact, it will be governmental malpractice on the part of a nation to have uh, uh, to not to have any capabilities to spy on others that's that comes with the territory so again one should be surprised at the fake surprise eric let me ask you about the relationship between obama and Rousseff. uh th this strategic relationship that was talked about bush and lula has it been built on or are these two still trying to find their footing in terms of their relationship? It's really interesting how the relationships between countries can often be uh, determined or certainly influenced by the relationship between individual leaders. We actually saw that when I was in the White House in the 1990s between President Clinton and then President uh, Fernando Enrique Cardoso. They had a close personal relationship. Uh, the last state visit, in fact, 1995, uh, President Clinton invited Fernando Enrique to Camp David. This is something that had never happened to a Latin leader before. Very personal. You fast forward forward to President Bush and Lula. Yes, they had a personal relationship, even though their politics were widely divergent. And yet, that was really the glue that held the, per the broader relationship together. Now you have the, the relationship between Barack Obama and Dilma Rousseff, which by all accounts is proper, and it's formal, and it's uh, effective, but it doesn't have the warmth that previous presidential relationships have had. And I think you saw that the last time President uh, Rousseff was in Washington about a year ago and the photos of the meeting at the Oval Office and there was a certain stiffness there. And I think that that uh, in large measure also determines where governments go. They really take the cues from their leadership. And would you agree? Absolutely, absolutely. That's, uh, that's true. And it's, um, it's sad. And it, uh, there is much to lament. These two countries, the United States and Brazil, uh, can uh, very quickly develop initiatives that will be very, very positive for their peoples. There is no other bilateral relationship in the world that is so ready to uh, create all kinds of possibilities by working together with more trust, uh, with more shared uh, project initiatives, investments, trade. But there is deep uh, antagonism. There is a deeply rooted, the United States doesn't understand Brazil, and the Brazilians have uh, um, are wary uh, of, of this giant. These are the two giant countries in the hemisphere that don't understand each other and miss a huge opportunity to do a lot of good to their citizens. Eric, I saw you shaking your head. No, I totally agree. Uh, you know, we are two friends which constantly act like I don't know what the proper expression is, but two blind people in a dark room or something, always reaching out but never quite finding each other. And we don't seem to understand each other the way, for example, the United States and Canada might understand each other or the way Brazil might understand some of its neighbors. And, and this is a real uh, setback because, as Moises says, the potential of the relationship, two massive democracies, two large economies, two countries that are at peace that have worked together in World War II and various other places around the world, peacekeeping global globally in Haiti and Africa. This is a real potential relationship that could be much stronger. Can BRICS nations like Brazil create a new international political situation block, would you say? Not soon. Uh, what happened was that in the, in the last decade, uh, we had the BRICS, 
uh, the, the countries, a grouping of countries that included Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These were large countries that grew, that economies grew very fast and very well. And, you know, economic success breeds the geopolitical ambitions. So these countries said, not only are we are now big economies, we can also be big players in the world stage. Well, and what happens is that that growth is now sputtering. All of these countries that were growing at double-digit rates or uh, very high rates uh, are now not growing. Brazil barely uh, is barely growing. Um, India used to grow at 11, 10 percent, right. and now right. is growing at four. It has a devaluation of its currency. Uh, China is growing less. Russia, which is an, a petrostate, is an oil country, and oil prices are at about $100 or more, and Russia is not growing. So the BRICS are no longer the engines of the world economy. Gentlemen, a very thoughtful discussion. Thank you so much for stopping by. I appreciate thank, it. Thank you. Thank you.